Great. Hi, hi again, everyone. So um, uh, I'm Jeff Navin. In addition to my Boundary Stone hat, I am the Director of External Affairs for TerraPower. We're an advanced nuclear developer that's uh, working to deploy the natrium technology outside of a coal plant that's slated to be retired in Kemmerer, uh, Wyoming, which I think, Ted, you uh, visited uh, near there. Great. So TerraPower got its start about 15 years ago. Uh, our chairman and founder is a guy named Bill Gates, pretty successful in technology. Um, he had a foundation, has a foundation. He got a bunch of smart people together and asked this question. What are the technologies that we're going to need to commercialize to make sure that we can solve the dual challenges of global energy poverty and climate change uh, that aren't going to come to the market unless somebody like me steps up and sort of makes some in investments um, in innovation? And nuclear was at the top of that list. Um, and be Bill being Bill wanted to look very deeply on what are the innovations that we can bring to the nuclear industry to move the uh, technology forward. Uh, TerraPower kind of came out of those conversations. So um, uh, fast forward, 2020, a really big year for TerraPower. Rita was actually the Assistant Secretary of Nuclear Energy um, around shortly around this time. And um, TerraPower won an award from the US Department of Energy through the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program to build a first-of-a-kind commercial reactor. Uh, it's up to $2 billion in federal funds. We will match that, though dollar-for-dollar uh, uh, grant uh, or, or, or private cost share uh, to build the first plant. The idea is first-of-a-kind nuclear is very hard, it's very expensive, and it allows uh, uh, these technologies to come uh, to, to fruition in the US. The other winner is a company called X Energy. Um, they're building a high-temperature gas reactor, which interesting about that reactor is their customer is not a utility. They're selling the heat to Dow Chemical to run a chemical facility in Texas. So it's not an electricity, I mean, it can produce electricity, but they're not, their primary product there uh, with this particular application is, is the heat. Um, we uh, are, like I said, building our reactor outside of Kemmerer, Wyoming. Um, we expect to break ground as soon as the ground thaws uh, this spring. Um, we're waiting for an environmental review uh, to be complete, but we will break ground on our site for a advanced reactor this spring. So uh, again, to sort of, to Rita's point, these are not far off into the future, decades from now, 10 years from being 10 years away. Um, we're gonna start construction on the non-nuclear portion of our reactor um, in the spring. So that, that is, is pretty exciting. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about the technology. I will say I have a degree in English, so unlike Dr. Barrenwall can point out all of the mistakes that I make in trying to describe the nuclear technology, but we're pretty excited about um, uh, the reactor that we're building. Natrium is a nuclear reactor. It differs from conventional reactors like the AP-1000, which is the you know, currently the most uh, uh, advanced technological reactor that is, that is um, uh, in operation. But it differs from the sort of conventional reactors in three major ways. The first is the size, right? Uh, AP-1000 is 1,100 megawatts over a gigawatt. Most of the big reactors that you see, if you think about the big cooling towers, are kind of in that range. We're 345 megawatts, so a third or a fourth of the size of the big conventional reactors. Um, we did that for a couple of reasons. The biggest one, honestly, um, is just sort of market, right? Um, our, uh, finding utilities that are willing to go buy really, really big reactors that are very, very expensive, just a little more difficult. Secondly, it fits well into what our strategies, we'll talk a little bit about the transition from coal, thermal coal plants uh, to nuclear. And then we do think we're gonna get some cost advantages by being able to build a lot of the components in factories rather than having to build them on site. Rita just uh, talked about that as well. The second way and probably the most, um, the biggest differentiator is the kind of coolant that we use. Virtually every reactor operating around the world um, uses water as its coolant. Um, uh, it ha water has a lot of benefits to it. It's a moderator, so you can run in a thermal spectrum. It's plentiful. Um, and it does a very good job of removing heat. The one challenge with water is its boiling point, right, at 100 degrees C, um, much lower than the temperature that the fuel rods are sort of creating when the, when the fission reaction occurs. So if you're a nuclear plant operator, one of the things that you spend most of your time doing is ensuring that that coolant, that water, is cool water's moving over your core, hot water's being removed. And if, you, if, if something interrupts that process, 
the coolant will boil off, it becomes a gas, you no longer have cool, coolant over those fuel rods, they melt together and eventually melt down through the, through the floor of the reactor. Sodium is a element, natrium in Latin for anybody who studied that, um, um, hence the name of our reactor. Um, its boiling point is 860 degrees, 63 degrees Celsius. So it can't boil off. Our, our, our fuel rods don't get hot enough to turn that liquid sodium into a gas. So we don't need pumps. We don't need auxiliary power. We don't need redundant backup safety systems because that threat of losing the coolant through uh, boiling and evaporation doesn't exist for our reactor. As a result, our reactor design is very boring, right? If you look at the cross-section of our reactor and you look at the cross-section of some other reactors, because we don't need all of those redundant safety systems, it's essentially a pool of sodium with the control rods and the reactor uh, inside of it. And we use natural convection, physics, and just heat removal via the air in order to run our cooling system. That allows us to be inherently safe and cheaper. Right? because we, our engineered costs are much lower. We also operate at atmospheric pressure, right? So for engineers in the room, if you can imagine, uh, well, as you know, um, when you're running a high pressure system, that just puts a lot more sort of um, um, literally pressure on your, on your welds, on your valves, et cetera. So it allows us um, to, to simplify some of that engineering as well. The third way that we're different, and I think that, um, um, I think that this, uh, is one of the really big differentiators that we have is that um, instead of using the heat to directly just generate steam and spin a turbine, which is what most reactors do, this, the, you know, is uh, we use that heat to run a power, a very large thermal energy storage system. So we use molten salt. Now, uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with concentrated solar technology. These are the, the mirrors that you know, sort of concentrate the sun's rays and they, they heat up a salt and that's how they use that hot salt in order to produce electricity. That's what we're using. Off-the-shelf technology that's been used around the world in the solar industry, uh, we use that to store energy. So what does that mean? It means natrium can produce 345 megawatts of base load, carbon-free power 24-7, or, and it can store up to 500 megawatts of carbon-free electricity for up to five and a half hours. That's gigawatt scale energy storage, right? It's about 2.75 um, gigawatt hours of storage. Now, one of the big things that got a lot of attention in Australia and around the world, right, was the Elon Musk, the big Tesla battery storage facility that, uh, um, that he built here. That's about 195 megawatt hours. So an order of magnitude larger energy storage. Why does that matter? Because uh, uh, it allows us to be a key enabler to reaching net zero goals. We are a nuclear technology that enables more renewables to be put onto the grid in a way that's efficient and in a way that uh, enables us to more quickly get um, to net zero. So this is what our plant looks like. On the, um, on the right is our nuclear island. Um, that's where the reactor is, and then we move that heat across over to the, to the, to the left. You see those tanks. That's our uh, molten salt energy storage system, and that's where the uh, electricity production happens. So again, you get that energy storage piece. It's a simplified design, just like Rita talked about. It's a much smaller footprint and a smaller um, uh, emergency planning zone um, um, as well. So again, here's our safety case, right? Um, it's a pretty, pretty boring re reactor design, which we're pretty proud of. Um, we focus on uh, um, the three C's, control, uh, cooling, and containment. We use gravity-fed control rods like most of, most of uh, the modern reactors do today if we needed to stop the reaction quickly. Um, the cooling happens via physics, like I, I mentioned, um, and um, uh, uh, the containment is all, all within that, that pool of, of sodium. So, um, like I said, we, we are uh, pretty excited about building this plant and what it's going to mean um, for Wyoming. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the project itself because I think it's relevant to some of the conversations that you're having here um, in, in Australia. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we looked at four sites that our utility partner Pacificorp had. They had announced in the state of Wyoming that they're closing their four coal plants. Um, coal is the largest industry in that state very politically unpopular decision, but just where the market was going, they had made the decision to phase out the use of coal by the utility. 
all four of the sites that we went and talked to were enthusiastic about this reactor. Um, and, um, and we chose Kemmerer um, for, for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, um, Kemmerer's, Kemmerer is a pretty interesting place. Uh, coal was discovered there and they opened a mine in 1897. It's the largest open pit coal mine in the United States. It has about 300 employees. The population of Kemmerer being 2,700 people, that's a pretty big uh, employer. Second largest employer is the coal plant. It's been in operation since 1963, has about 110 workers there. As you can imagine, when the utility announced that they were going to shut down the coal plant, which actually puts the coal mine's future uh, at risk as well, it was a pretty big deal in that community. And they were worried about whether or not they're going to be able to keep their hospitals open, keep their schools open, how they were going to maintain their economic vitality. Um, and so um, when we made the announcement that we were going to come there, um, when we called the mayor, the mayor said, I'm, I'm almost in tears. Um, and we gave a lifeline to this community that um, uh, we're really, really, um, we're really, really, really proud of. So um, uh, we'll have about 1,600 construction workers at peak. So now their concern is, how are we going to make sure that we have the uh, space available for all of these workers? Um, how, does, uh, how do we expand our wastewater treatment plant to deal with all of these folks? And in terms of our full-time employees, we'll have between 200 and 250 full-time employees operating this plant. Licensed a uh, lifetime for 60 years with the ability to extend that license for another 20. So we're promising this community 200 to 250 very good full-time, high-paying jobs for the next 60 to 80, 80 years. That's a really, really big deal for the community. So why, what do we get out of it, right, besides uh, an enthusiastic uh, community that's excited about our project? Number one, those workers. We need to find 200 to 250 people to work at our plant. They have 100 highly trained, unionized, skilled workers. We have a promise that each one of them that wants a job at the nuclear plant will be able to walk across the road when the coal plant shuts down and the nuclear plant operates uh, and, and, and keep those jobs. Uh, and this community has a really high energy IQ. The state has a very high energy IQ. They know what it takes to produce electricity. And as we've said uh, multiple times, if you've been comfortable with a coal plant as your neighbor for the past 40 to 50 years, you are going to love having a nuclear plant as your neighbor for the next 60 to 80 years. We also get infrastructure. So um, uh, uh, that includes, most importantly for us, the grid interconnect. Um, transmission is a very scarce resource in the United States. It's becoming even more valuable. So we have a grid interconnect that we can attach to right there. We also have, um, we also have the, the uh, water. Right, so there are water rights in the, in the West, in the United States, water rights are very important, so we'll be able to use the coal plant's water rights in order to run our, our steam um, 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 uh, uh, generator. So when you think, about, um, you think about sort of what the energy grid of the future looks like, and Stephen you know, talked about this, um, we're able to provide carbon-free baseload power, we're able to support intermittent and variable renewable energy, largely wind in, um, in Wyoming, um, and make sure that that uh, power can be used efficiently so that they don't have to overbuild and dump power when it's, when it's not available. We can store power um, and then back that up as necessary. And then that energy, that energy uh, storage piece. So, um, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, um, how advanced nuclear can support this grid. Well, like I said, we're smaller. We can do baseload. We can also do flexible. There's nothing on the market right now that can do all of those things. Um, and then finally, um, we talked a little bit about the energy security piece um, as well. And um, this is why the U.S. government is investing in this type of technology, uh, both for our own energy security, but um, last week I was in Vienna, Austria for the International Atomic Energy Agency's General Conference, and the level of interest that we are seeing in these technologies from Europe, particularly Central and Eastern Europe, who are desperate to get off of their dependence on Russian gas and find ways to power their economies that don't require them to import uh, fossil fuel commodities from Russia is very, very high. So, so um, we're very excited uh, about, about the future. Um, like I said, these sort of twin challenges now of energy security and climate, I think Rita's slide had a slide that said almost basically the exact same thing, um, uh, are really driving um, a, a, lot, a lot of our interest. Um, and then uh, and one, one final thing that I'll note as well, because I think this is relevant um, to, to Australia, um, 
Wyoming had a ban on nuclear power up until 2019. Um, they lifted that ban. And they lifted that ban not at our urging. They, they just had some forward-thinking legislators who said, we might want to think about this as our future. In less than two years, the utility had reached out to us and had signed the deal to bring natrium to Wyoming. It didn't take a decade. It didn't take a long period of time. It was very quickly after lifting that moratorium. Now, they are also, uh, uh, Wyoming is not probably the most net zero friendly state in um, all of the United States or region in the world, but they do recognize that this is where the market is heading. They also have the largest uranium reserves in the United States as well. And one of our biggest supporters uh, in Wyoming is actually the Mining Association, which is mostly coal miners, right, uh, coal mining companies. Why are they interested in that? Because they know that coal mining is not going to be a growth industry in their state, and they think that the opportunities to shift some of that workforce into uranium mining uh, is a real opportunity for leadership uh, 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 for them. So it's been great to be a part of a journey in that state, and in a very short period of time after lifting their moratorium, to see this project coming into, into Wyoming. Um, and there's uh, hopefully some lessons that Australia can learn there as well. Great. Thanks. <laughs>